So in the past 30 years, possibly 20 years, there's been a revolution in cognitive neuroscience, in systems neuroscience, a revolution that's been um, accelerated by the capability to look at the brain in action, to uh, image the brain using either metabolic or hemodynamic uh, tools like functional magnetic resonance imaging, or indeed using electromagnetic responses as measured non-invasively by EEG and MEG. The picture that is emerging of how the brain works has two aspects. On the one side, it is clear that different parts of the brain are specialised for, for processing particular aspects of our sensorium, for doing particular cognitive operations like, say, memory or attention or processing of emotions. Nearly every um, job that your brain does that you can conceive of probably has a dedicated brain system or set of areas or regions that talk to each other. So that's the principle of functional specialization. And when that specialization becomes segregated in a little cortical area, say the size of my thumbnail, for example, uh, visual motion processing roughly in this part of the brain here, that segregation is, in, is known as functional segregation. So a segregation of a functional um, specialization for doing a particular thing of the many things that the brain does. We have, for the first 10 years, spent a lot of time with careful experimental design, uh, rigorous data analysis, trying to assign functional specialization uh, to different brain areas to build a map of how, what different parts of the brain are responsible for. This is known as cartography. It's also been criticized as neophrenology. So phrenology was a, uh, a procedure um, many centuries ago whereby it was thought literally by palpating the skull and feeling for little lumps and knobs and bumps, one could diagnose uh, and infer the sort of person and the competences and the functional uh, um, uh, processes that, that, that uh, the brain was engaged in simply by palpating. And many people think that functional neuroimaging, functional imaging, uh, suffers from the same philosophical shortcoming just by looking at bumps in metabolic activity or regional hotspots, um, often referred to as blobs, uh, you're just recapitulating um, the same sort of conceptual error that the phrenologists of the, um, of the 19th century uh, were committing. That criticism, I think, is greatly mitigated by the second principle, and the second principle is functional integration. So on the one hand, we have these segregated brain regions sometimes referred to as nodes in, um, in a graph or a distributed network. And then we have to think about how those nodes or those regions are coupled or connected, how they talk to each other, how they are integrated, how that processing is distributed over nodes or regions in a coordinated and organized and functional way. And that integration of the distributed responses, the distributed pressing, is as functional integration. So now you're in the game of having established all your favorite functionally specialized areas, now you want to know how they are integrated, how they talk to each other, how they are coupled. And over the past um, decade or so, it's become clear there are two ways in which one can characterize this coupling functionally. You can either just look at correlations in activity of two brain regions. So say um, we imagine we have two parts of the brain, this one dealing with visual information from the um, one side of the visual field and this one dealing with visual information from the other side of the visual field. And if they talk to each other and share information, we might expect that during our brain imaging experiments um, or during our EEG experiments, as the activity in one of these areas goes up, so will the activity in the other area. So there's now a correlation or a statistical dependency between the measured responses in each of these functionally segregated or specialized brain areas. And that's known as functional connectivity. It's easy to measure 
um, it's operationally defined and what it tells you is that somehow the processing over time of these two different brain areas are coupled in the sense that they're likely to do, be doing similar things so they are both engaged in the same distributed pattern of activity. What it doesn't tell you is how the activity here influences the activity here and vice versa. So just knowing two things are correlated or functionally connected doesn't tell you about the directed influence that one brain region exerts over another. And that's called effective connectivity. So functional connectivity, correlations, dependencies, an operational definition. Effective connectivity, directed causal connections mediated by long slender axonal neuronal processes so that you're driving activity here in a way that depends upon the activity here. So that's where dynamic causal modelling comes in. So dynamic causal modelling speaks to the fact that in order to make sense of brain imaging data, for example, or EEG data or MEG data, you have to have a model of how this part of the system influences this part of the system and vice versa. You have to do that in order to interpret the data and put very simply, once you've established a model, that a model of coupling, then you can ask what coupling parameters, what model parameters of that causal model, a model of the causal influences of this part of the system or node on this part of the system, best account for the observed data. So this is, um, in a sense, a model fitting exercise where you've got this distributed pattern of activity throughout the brain and you want to fit this particular model to explain the data and this particular model is all about the dynamics of fluctuations of brain regions that are causing activity in other brain regions, hence dynamic causal modelling. Technically, it's just a state-space model. Uh, it's the sort of uh, models which people engage in any time series analysis uh, would normally call upon to understand um, how, say, the weather unfolds. So, uh, technically speaking, these are exactly the same sorts of models you'd be, you'd be using for weather forecasting. Or, um, in economics, the fluctuations in the markets, how one event over here um, causes changes in an event over here and how that unfolds over time as many distributed events all cause each other in a reciprocal and recurrent way. So that is in essence dynamic causal modelling. It's the, um, the technology that has been brought to bear on deep questions about functional integration, about functional architectures. So we've moved beyond the functional anatomy of functional specialization and segregation and now we're talking about networks, distributed processing and architectures that are equipped not just with where stuff is happening but how stuff here is distributed and influences and causes stuff over here. And then there are all sorts of interesting questions about the brain network, about what has recently been called the connectome. How does that architecture um, inform our understanding of how the brain works. So one simple example here would be the notion of a brain hierarchy. The idea that there are certain nodes or regions in the brain that are very close to sensory information, say the back of the brain in receipt of visual information, uh, primary auditory cortex and on the side of the brain directly in receipt of um, um, hearing or auditory uh, information. Um, and these parts of the brain would be at a hierarchically lower level and yet if we move into the hierarchy deeper in the brain, say towards the front of the brain for example, um, then we have this notion that there are parts of the brain engaged in higher level, more abstract representations, um, modelling of the causes of the sensory inputs. Because if you have a model of a, the brain as a hierarchy of interconnected regions with some levels of the hierarchy being subordinate or lower to higher levels of the hierarchy, then that presupposes there's a difference between bottom-up connections and 
top-down connections. So that distinction is absolutely fundamental to understand functional brain architectures. And implicit in that distinction between bottom-up, from the sensorium, from the sensory cortical areas, through to higher cortical areas, say in the prefrontal cortex, um, at the front of the brain, then you are talking about the difference between directed connections, which of course requires you to measure this directed effective connectivity. So many of the applications of dynamic causal modelling are to understand data from um, brain imaging experiments either with fMRI or the electromagnetic sort in terms of the distinction between bottom-up processing and top-down processing. And one important aspect of that top-down processing is to contextualise and to select the channels that can provide the bottom-up input. So um, as I'm talking, then I am um, selecting specifically certain cues uh, in terms of you know, when I you know, uh, should say certain words and where I am uh, in terms of uh, the narrative that I'm pursuing. And in that selection, I am giving weight to and modulating and contextualizing the sorts of information that I need to sample to work out what I'm going to do next. So that practically simply means switching on some connections and switching off other connections. So what am I saying here? That, well, to understand the context-sensitive nature of functional architectures in the brain, we need to understand how the connection strengths, the effect of connectivity between different brain areas is itself contextualised and controlled on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. So that's probably the most interesting aspect of dynamic causal modelling. It is not the architecture in and of itself, although that is very important. It's how those connection strengths, that coupling, changes as a function of what I am doing, what I'm attending to, what I'm intending to do. So all that higher cognitive function becomes then characterised in terms of tuning the coupling and selecting which connections are in play at any one time. So dynamic calls and modelling in conclusion is a, um, a modelling procedure that allows one to pose questions about functional brain architectures or indeed the architectures of any coupled and dynamical system to data, to ask questions not only about the, um, which connections are present and how they're deployed, is this a sort of centripetal or is it a hierarchical structure, is it fully connected, is it very sparse, um, does it have small world characteristics, all of these characteristics and way of understanding networks depend upon knowing which connections are present and which are not present and which are in play and which are not in play. Furthermore, beyond that, I can equip these models with a context sensitivity by saying in this condition these sets of connections will be active and in this situation they won't be. And I can have a connection context sensitivity built into my model and I can estimate that and start to tell you which connections you're using at the moment whilst, whilst listening to me.